The jury had just been excused after hearing closing arguments from both the defense and the prosecution. It was quite late, about four o'clock in the afternoon, so the judge ordered the jury back to the hotel, where they were sequestered for the two-week trial, which was the culmination of an investigation that had lasted nearly a year. The defendant was taken back to the Tarrant County Correctional Center in Fort Worth, and nothing more happened until Monday, when the jury would reconvene. So I decided to walk back to my room at the Hilton Garden Inn in downtown Dallas, stopping at a bar on the way for a beer and a bite to eat. I had just finished my burger and was halfway through my beer when I heard a woman's voice behind me. Hey, cowboy, buy a girl something to drink? She asked. I turned and looked at the source of the question. She looked familiar and then it hit me. Ashley? Ashley Marks, is that really you? I asked. Yes, that's me, she said, flashing a smile that could melt the polar cap. I invited her to sit down and wave to the waitress. My God, how long ago was that? Sixteen? Seventeen years? How's it going? I asked. I think it's been seventeen years, she said. Ashley was one of my best friends in high school, along with Steve Jenkins and Jolene Carter. Together, we were known as the Four Musketeers. But that all changed when Ashley's dad got a job in Austin during our senior year. I haven't seen or heard from her since. I'm doing well, she said. Went to college at the University of Texas, graduated, got married, got divorced, and now work as a reporter for the Austin Statesman newspaper. Wow, you've had a very interesting life. What happened? I asked. She shrugged. I was married, she said, emphasizing the I. Unfortunately, he wasn't. Or at least he had trouble remembering his vows. After I caught him cheating a third time, I said enough was enough and kicked his city ass to the curb, she said. I think he ended up running a McDonald's in Beaumont. I'm sorry to hear that, I said. I know what it's like, believe me. So what brings you to the Big D? I've been covering the Jenkins trial for the last couple weeks. What a mess. The other day I watched you testify, she said. I feel very sorry for Jolene. Whatever her faults, she didn't deserve to die this way. I didn't say anything to that. No, Jolene didn't deserve to die like that. I would have preferred something more torturous, like burning at the stake. But that possibility, like so many other things, had been taken away from me by the man I'd once considered my best friend. So, how are you doing, Bill Jennings? She asked, interrupting my train of thought. About as well as expected considering the last 16 years of my life have been a total sham, I said. At least you have kids, she said. I nodded. Yeah, I guess so, I said. They're mine, at least legally. You may not be a donor, but believe me, you are their father in every way that really matters, she said. You're probably right, I said. But it still doesn't make me feel any better. Look, I have a confession to make, she began. I looked at her, wondering what she had up her sleeve. You know, every reporter in this courtroom is going to want to know your story. I'd like to be the one to tell it, if that's okay with you, she said. I know you probably have a lot of trust issues, and I totally understand. But no one knows you like I do. Look, if it helps, we'll sign a contract. You give me exclusive rights to your story, and I protect you from the wolves. Kind of like a publicist. I'm not publishing anything without letting you see it first. My editor has already approved it, and I want it done right. Deep down, I knew she was right. Reporters from every major news outlet in the country, CNN, Fox News, Associated Press, you name it. I've even been contacted by a few small but well-known bloggers. It was all so overwhelming. Something told me I could trust her, so I made up my mind. Okay, Ashley, I said. You made a deal. So how exactly does this happen? Do we do it here? Do we move it to my hotel room or yours? What do you mean? Well, she said, I've wanted to see the old homestead for a long time. It's only two or two and a half hours west of here by car. It's still pretty early, and the jury doesn't start deliberating until Monday morning, so we have the weekend off. Why don't we drive back and you can show me where all this happened? You'll give me the details on the way, and after we get there, I can talk to your kids and parents if that's okay with you. I thought for a moment before agreeing. It would be a nice break from the trial, and I thought it would be nice to show Ashley around the neighborhood and maybe repair the relationship. Sounds good, I said. 
Where are you staying? I'm at the Hilton around the corner. What about you? She asked. Same thing. Do you want to grab a couple things first before we hit the road? She nodded, and we agreed to meet at my truck in the parking lot. You can't miss it, I told her. It's a big blue cab. It's still the same bill. He's got to have the biggest pickup truck in the state. Give me about a half hour after we get there so I can change into something more comfortable and grab a few things, okay? She asked. I agreed and we hit the road. The sun had already dipped below the horizon when we pulled onto Highway 20, leading towards Abilene. I was glad for that since I hate driving in the sun. Ashley had changed into her professional reporter's outfit and was now wearing a knee-length denim skirt and a white western-style blouse. She seemed as beautiful to me now as she had in high school. I also got a good look at her shapely legs and felt a familiar stirring below the waist. She smiled. I know what you're thinking, cowboy, she said. Really? I asked. You're thinking something along the lines of why didn't I sleep with Ashley and not Jolene? I laughed. Is that what your honed reporter's instinct tells you? I asked. No, the way you check my legs. Like you did back in high school, she said. I bet I thought I'd forgotten about that. Legs like that are hard to forget, I told her. I always liked looking at her legs, especially when she was wearing her cheerleader uniform. She smiled and pulled out a tape recorder. So tell me, Ashley, is there a mister? Right anywhere in Austin? No, she said. Since my divorce, I focused almost entirely on work. As you can imagine, I've had a lot of trust issues with men, and so far I just haven't met anyone I really want to spend time with. Sorry to hear that, I said. She laughed. Somehow I doubt it, she said. Damn those reporter instincts. Anyway, what do you say we start this little road show? Yeah, okay, I said. She put her recorder on the dashboard, making sure it wouldn't fall off. You don't mind if I write this down, do you? She asked. I shook my head. Not at all, I said. I want you to do it right. I took a sip of my coffee and thought for a bit before I started. Ashley, as you know, Steve and Jolene and I were very friendly in high school. After you left, it was mostly just the three of us. I asked Jolene to marry me right after graduation, and she said yes. Steve and I both joined the Marines right out of high school. We both went to San Diego for boot camp and even ended up in the same platoon. Jolene and I agreed that we would get married after I finished my training. After boot camp, Steve and I broke up. He went into the infantry and I went into computer electronics. He was assigned to Camp Pendleton and I was assigned to Quantico, Virginia. Anyway, about a month or so later, Steve hurt his knee badly and ended up getting a medical leave of absence. You'll notice that he still walks with a slight limp. Couldn't they have given him a desk job? asked Ashley. No, it doesn't work that way, I said. Everyone in the Corps is a basic marksman, regardless of their MOS or specialty. Even clerks and computer guys like me have to meet the physical requirements to participate in combat. Steve came home and his father pulled strings to get him into the county. Right, his father was a county commissioner, wasn't he? asked Ashley. I nodded. Yes, until the day he died. That's how Steve was first elected. I guess the voters thought highly enough of old man Jenkins to elect his son. I graduated, came home, and got married. Steve was my best man. I found out later that he was also Jolene's best man, if you know what I mean. That bitch, Ashley said. I ended up on the West Coast, and almost nine months after we were married, Brian was born. About a year later, I was sent to Okinawa for a year unaccompanied. We came home for a month, and I let Jolene and Brian stay in my house that I had inherited from my grandparents. We decided it would be easier for them if both of our parents were around. After that tour, I came home, packed up Jolene and Brian, and we headed to my next duty station, Camp Legend, North Carolina. Just under nine months later, Jessica was born. Jolene took the pregnancy hard and insisted that I have a vasectomy. She argued that if we ever wanted another child, I could always have the surgery reversed. And I agreed. Although if I had known then what I know now, things would have been very different. Looking at the pictures, it's easy to see Steve's traits in the kids, Ashley said. 
Didn't you notice it when they were born? That's a pretty fair question, I said. You might remember that when we were younger, people often said that Steve and I could pass for brothers. We have the same hair color and the same eyes. Hell, we even have the same earlobes. No, they both looked a lot like me when they were little, and they both have their mother's eyes and nose. It wasn't until they got much older that I started to notice the resemblance. When we get to my house, you'll see baby pictures. Anyway, I finished my service in the Corps and we all came home. Dad took me to his computer store and introduced me to all the other guys. I went straight to work for him, which was great. Unfortunately, I had to do a lot of traveling to do that. Did it ever bother Jolene? Ashley asked. I shook my head. No. Just the opposite. She seemed to enjoy my customer service and networking. Dad got clients in Dallas, Abilene, Wichita Falls, Amarillo, everywhere. Heck, we even had clients in Houston and Oklahoma City. Jolene thought it was great that I was building such a large client base, I said. In fact, my absence gave her all the time she needed to bring Steve into our home and into our bed. Of course, I found that out much later. You mean she actually did Steve in your marital bed? asked Ashley. Yeah. All the damn time, I said. That's why I burned it and the mattress after she got shot. I don't blame you, Ashley said. I burned a few other things too, like the couch and chair Steve used, I said. Jolene's wedding dress burned too. Ashley wrinkled her nose. So Steve was a regular guest at your house, Ashley said. Yes, so much so that he even had his own chair. I didn't mind at the time since I considered him a friend. He'd come over to my place, especially on Sunday after church. We'd start watching the game, and he'd almost always fall asleep in that damn chair. The kids also started calling him Uncle Steve, almost at Jolene's insistence. It annoyed me at the time, but now I know why. Hey, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't mind warming up my coffee. Are you ready for a pit stop? I asked. Ashley turned off the recorder. Sure, she said. I could take a smoke break if that's okay with you. I nodded and turned toward the next exit. After taking a break from the road, we were back on the highway, heading towards Abilene. Ashley pulled out her voice recorder and set it on the dashboard. So all this time you had no idea Jolene was cheating on you with Steve? She asked. No, I guess I was the typical clueless husband. She never disrespected me, at least to my face, and there was never even a hint of sex in the house when I was away. I guess they've been pretty careful over the years, I said. When did you find out? She asked. About a year ago, I was sent to Los Angeles for a month-long training course on an ERP package we were contracted to support for a San Antonio client. Jolene and the kids did a great job of emailing me and calling me every day. One weekend, I got an email from Brian. Jolene and Steve had taken the kids to the lake to fish, and he had caught a pretty big bass. And he sent me a picture, I said. I pulled out my phone and handed it to Ashley, telling her which album to open. The picture I was looking for showed Brian holding a large fish. Sitting next to him was Steve. Jolene was standing on the other side of Brian with her left hand on Steve's right shoulder. What do you see in this picture? I asked Ashley. My God! she exclaimed. They look so much alike. They even have the same dimples. Yeah, I said. I noticed that too. Now look at Jolene's left hand. What stands out in it? Ashley arranged the picture and enlarged it with her fingers. I don't see any rings, she said. That's right, I said. You'll never guess where they were. Ashley threw me a perplexed look. I led her over to the folder where Jessica's pictures were kept. Look over there until you see an ashtray, I said. Okay, I get it, she said. Magnify the picture and tell me what you see. Her eyes widened as she zoomed in on the image. Is that what I think it is? She asked. I nodded. Yes. The same ring I put on her finger when I married her, along with my great-grandmother's wedding ring. And guess whose butts are in that tray? Let me guess, Steve's, she said. Oh, that's not all, I told her. That ashtray is not only in our bedroom, it's on my nightstand. Which means Steve was in our bed, probably with Jolene. Ashley started to cry. How could she do that to you? And you say Jessica sent this? 
she asked. Yeah, I said. She often helped my mom clean the house, which meant cleaning and wiping down all the ashtrays. She saw it before they left and took a picture and sent it to me. She was very upset. I can imagine, Ashley said. Did she say anything to Jolene? Not that I know of, no. I wrote her back and asked her not to say anything to my mom. I also asked her to take the rings out, put them in her pocket, and mail them to me. Ashley laughed. I bet Jolene was tied up for that, she said. Yeah, Jessica has been acting like a real trooper this whole time. She did everything I asked, but Jolene was going crazy trying to find those rings. She even invited Steve over to help her search. They went through the garbage, opened siphons under sinks, that sort of thing. Too bad I wasn't around to record it. So what did you do? Ashley asked. My course ended on Friday afternoon, so I went straight away and came home on Saturday night. Jolene met me on the street crying because she had lost her grandmother's ring. She was completely out of it. I asked all the usual questions. Did you look everywhere? Did you put it on the sink and so on? She kept insisting that she had looked everywhere. Then I reached into my pocket and pulled them out. I thought she was going to faint. How did you get them? She asked. I simply said a trusted friend found them and mailed them to me. I didn't mention Jessica's part because I figured she'd tear it apart. I just told her, don't put them in the ashtray the next time Steve comes over. That was priceless. Her eyes got as big as saucers and she started crying, telling me all the usual crap about loving me. Oh, I'm sorry, I said, seeing the look on Ashley's face. I didn't mean to swear. That's all right, she said. I've heard and said much worse, believe me. So tell me, what did you do then? Well, I pretty much knew then that it was over between us, I said. I didn't have any real evidence of them cheating, no pictures or anything like that. I decided to start investigating and get everything ready. The first thing I wanted to do was to take DNA tests. I needed to find out if these were my children. I also purchased some surveillance equipment from our store. High-definition motion-activated cameras, voice-activated audio recorders, everything I needed. I even bugged our cell phone. Everything was recorded on my home server and backed up to the cloud. I waited until she left to go shopping and installed it all. The DNA was pretty easy to do. One of our clients in Dallas is a lab that does this kind of testing, and they got me everything I needed. I took samples from the kids, asking them not to say anything to their mother took my own sample and waited for the next Sunday when Steve came in. As usual, he fell asleep in the chair he always sat in, so swabbing his cheek was pretty easy. It took me a week to get the results because I had the lab mail them to the store. The tests showed that there was a 99.9% .9 probability that Steve was the father of both children, which meant that he and Jolene had been at it for at least 16 years, if not longer. And all this time you never guessed a thing? asked Ashley. No. Not the slightest clue. I'm sure if I'd sat down and analyzed everything carefully, I might have guessed. But that's the thing. She'd never given me any reason to question her fidelity before. Our sex life had always been on the up and up, even after we had kids. So I waited for other evidence to come forward. And it didn't take long. A week after I installed all the equipment, I received the first video evidence. I ended up going to Oklahoma City to set up the server and knew I'd be there for a couple days. The kids were at my parents' house, so Jolene was on her own. Shortly after I left, she called Steve and arranged for him to come overnight. I called from my hotel in OK City and spoke to her briefly, just to let her know I was there for her. She said she loved me, but by that time I didn't care anymore. After that call, I logged into my home server and waited. Sure enough, around 9 o'clock that night, they were in our bed doing the dirty deed. Naturally, he didn't use a condom, which really annoyed me. Worse than watching the two of them roar like animals was what I heard them say. What was that? asked Ashley. Wait a minute, I said. I have to turn onto this road. Then it's another 30 minutes. I had to concentrate on this stretch of road. It was getting dark, and there were no lights, no guardrails, and no white lines marking the sides of the road. Anyone who wasn't looking carefully could easily end up in a ditch or worse. It was also near where Steve's drug-dealing buddies were operating. Most of them had been arrested or stopped after Steve's death, but I was always on the lookout. A couple times I had to replace the windshield when it got knocked out. There was also a lot of wildlife, 
mostly armadillos and deer. I flicked on the high beam and turned on the light bar on the roof of the cab. Then I turned on the police scanner and CB radio and pulled my gun out of the glove compartment. I wasn't going to take any chances. Finally, we got to my house, and Ashley noticed a DSS car parked in the driveway. Who is it? she asked. Defense, I said. They've been watching this place since Steve's arrest. Some of his buddies thought they could burn the place down in retaliation, but we stopped them. It's cold. I patted the pistol in its holster. She realized what I meant. Are we going to be safe here? She asked. I nodded. Yeah, I said. We have round-the-clock security. DSS is also keeping an eye on my family and kids. I think most of Steve's buddies are already locked up, but we're not going to take any chances. Hell, they had to lay off almost the entire sheriff's department. Let's go check it out and I'll introduce you. After pulling into the garage, Ashley and I got out of the car and walked over to the patrol car. The police officer got out of the car and approached us. Bill Jennings? He asked. I thought you were all in Dallas for the trial. We shook hands. The trial just went to the jury this afternoon. By the way, this is Ashley Marks, a reporter from the Austin Statesman. She'll be with me this weekend, gathering information on Steve for an article, I said. Nodding to her, he touched the tip of his gray Stetson. Nice to meet you, ma'am, he said, smiling. He looked at me again. Things have been quiet so far. Since the Rangers took the last gang out of here, things have been quiet. But who knows? My replacement will show up soon. Thank you, I said. We shook hands and parted ways. Have a good night, you hear? He said as we headed for the door. I will, I said. You too. I set the coffee pot down and gave Ashley a tour of the house as we walked inside. The original house was built in 1866 by William Bryan Jennings after he returned from fighting for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Since then, the house has been expanded, remodeled, and modernized many times. But there are still a few places to see the original 150-year-old structure. Today, the house has five bedrooms on two floors and a three-car garage with a covered porch. The house had a bedroom for each of the two kids, a master bedroom, one room converted into a place for Jolene's sewing and needlework, and another room set up as a playroom TV room for the kids. I suggested Ashley sleep in the master bedroom since it was the only one with a bathroom, and I figured she would appreciate the privacy. I, on the other hand, could sleep on the futon in my den office downstairs, as I had been doing since I became convinced of Jolene's infidelity. Ashley, however, wouldn't hear of it. Nonsense, she said. This bed is big enough for four people. There's plenty of room, and we're both adults who can control ourselves. That threw me off balance. Okay, if you say so, I said. She smiled and led me down the stairs. You have a story to tell me, so let's get to it, she said. Let me call the kids first so they know we'll be there tomorrow, I said. I called my parents' house, talked to my dad, then to the kids. They were excited to see Ashley, and we agreed that we would be there for lunch. I grabbed my coffee and headed into the living room. As I put the cups down, I found that I had a stack of DVDs, and I grabbed them from the study where I kept them under lock and key. That should help a lot, I said. Her eyes widened. Oh my god, how many videos do you have? She asked. Quite a few, actually, I said. Some of it is from here at home. Some of it is from the security cameras in my office. I've also scanned all the documents, and I have a whole bunch of photos and audio recordings. So everything I have is here. And I have some copies just in case. I pulled out the disc, confirmed it was the one, and put it in the DVD player. Let me warn you that it's very graphic, I said. I'm ready, she said. I reminded her that this particular DVD confirmed my suspicions. I also reminded her to listen carefully to what it was about. I pressed play, and the clip started. Jolene walked into the bedroom, followed by Steve. Jolene took off her rings and tossed them into the ashtray on my nightstand. Steve, smiling, put out his cigarette on them. To hell with him and his great-grandmother's ring, Jolene said. Steve laughed. Ashley grimaced, tears welling up in her eyes. Eventually, they started having fun. Ashley covered her eyes. Apparently, it was too much for her. I fast-forwarded through the most graphic parts, and Ashley seemed to appreciate the gesture. 
It'll take about an hour, I said. It was bad enough as it was, but the pillow talk afterward is a real buzzkill. Thank you for letting all of this pass by, Ashley said. It's one thing to hear that someone you love and care about is cheating. It's quite another to watch it happen. They lay on their backs and smoked a cigarette. Steve pounced on Jolene's rings again. Jolene turned on her side, facing Steve. I'm pregnant again, baby. Looks like you're going to be a daddy again, she said. Steve frowned. Damn it, didn't you take your pills? He asked. Yeah, I might have missed a day or two, but that was pretty much it. Why can't you use a condom? I hate that kind of thing, he said. You know the rules. No rubber bands. I guess you'll have to get another abortion. Either that or convince him it's his baby. I can't have another abortion, Steve, she said. I've already had three and the last one almost killed me. I was so sick I ended up in the emergency room. Besides, you know deep shit had a vasectomy after Jessica was born. It was your idea to make sure he didn't get me pregnant. Well, what do you want to do? asked Steve. I want to go away and marry you, she said. That's all I've ever wanted. And I think Bill's got us figured out anyway. I told you I'm not the marrying kind. Besides, a family could complicate things for me, and I like what I have now. Bill works and pays and I get paid, he said. And don't worry about him knowing anything. Hell, he's so damn stupid. We could have fun right in front of him and he wouldn't realize a thing. Why don't you just do to him what you do to other guys, she said. Well, those guys were illegals anyway. No one would have missed them. Besides, who's going to cry over some scumbag drug dealers being in the country illegally? Heck, by getting rid of those guys, I probably secured half the voters. It's one thing to put a bullet in the head of an unknown illegal alien. It's another thing to do it to a respected member of society. Maybe you can have an accident, Jolene said. It wouldn't be the first time, and you know people die driving down Indian Trail all the time. People who do that are usually commuters looking for scenery, and they don't know the road like he does. We might be able to do something about it, but we won't get away from him just yet. Maybe we can find something that will incapacitate him gradually. Poison, for instance. Let's think about it for a while before we come up with a plan. Eventually, we will have to get rid of him, but let's do it right, and at the right time, maybe after the kids are out of the house. That way you get his insurance and part of his business. In the meantime, go to the new clinic in Abilene. They'll take better care of you than those quacks you went to last time. I'll keep an eye on Billy Boy. If it looks like he's going to do something stupid like go to a lawyer, I'll talk to him a little and bring him up to speed. Okay? Jolene nodded. Okay, baby, I'll do it. You're the man, she said, kissing his face. Now let's get on with it, she said. And the coupling started all over again. I stopped the video. Ashley shook her head, tears streaming down her face. I hate that bitch, she said. And you lived with her for 17 years? Please tell me you went to a lawyer after that. I went to see a lawyer. It was a very eventful day. Let me tell you about it, I said, beginning my narrative. I actually went to see a lawyer. As I had told Ashley, I had made an appointment with Alan Jackson the attorney who had taken care of all of our family's business and personal legal needs over the years. What I learned at that appointment cut me to the bone. I remembered my visit to Alan's office. After the initial greetings, I got straight to the point, showing him some of the evidence I had, including the DNA report and the videotape of Jolene's affair with Steve. Alan explained what I could expect. Although Texas is a community property state, a divorce can be granted based on adultery or cruelty. While adultery is not a crime in Texas, it can affect a judge's decision in the distribution of property and alimony. It can also be used in civil litigation. But Alan told me, the biggest problem I faced was not the law. Legally, he said, I had a win-win case. The problem, he added, was Steve. Listen, Bill, he said to me, Steve runs this county with an iron fist. He owns the sheriff's department, not to mention every judge in the county. And in Texas, you have to file a lawsuit in the county where you've lived for the last 90 days. Frankly, I don't think there's a judge in that county that will even hear your case. Besides, Jolene's pregnancy could delay the process. Texas courts won't finalize a divorce until the baby is born. It doesn't matter who the father of the child is. 
This is so that any final child support orders can be taken into consideration. One last thing, Bill. Steve has informed me that you may want to divorce Jolene. He made it clear that we are to inform him of any attempts to start divorce proceedings. Wait a minute, I said. Are you saying that Steve ordered you to violate attorney-client privilege and maybe even break the law by refusing to report a crime? Alan nodded his head. I'm afraid so, Bill. I don't like it one bit, but I have no desire to end up in a shallow grave on Indian Trail, if you know what I mean. You have no idea what you're up against, he said. I'm sorry, Bill. I really have no choice. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'm sorry too, Alan. I guess I don't have a choice either. You're fired. Right now. I need all of the family and business files, along with any backups you might have, and I want them now, I said. I guess that would be your answer, so I took the liberty of putting them all together, he said, pointing to two boxes of papers on the floor by the door. He pulled out a piece of paper, wrote some notes on it, and held it out to me. Thanks, he said, realizing that I had given him a way out. One more time, he said. I'm so sorry. I thought you and him were friends. Is there no way you can get over this thing with Jolene? You know, for the sake of the kids? Would you be able to stand not being known to be a cuckold for 17 years? I asked him. I don't think so, he said. Let me help you get those files out. It's the least I can do. He picked up the boxes of documents while I closed my briefcase and walked with me to the truck. Once there, he looked around before he spoke again. Call those people I listed in the paper I gave you, Bill. I didn't want to say anything in the office just in case, but the authorities are very interested in some of Steve's actions. No time to waste, please, he said. As far as I know, Steve is keeping tabs on you. Again, I'm sorry about that. Maybe after this is over, we can get together and work things out. I shook his hand. Thank you, Alan. I understand. We'll be in touch. I went back to the office, thinking over everything Alan had said. I wasn't too worried about firing Alan, since I knew my father would support my decision. I was more concerned about Steve and what he or his cronies might do to the family. I called the numbers Alan had given me and made an appointment with each of the three men mentioned. One was an expensive, high-ranking family law attorney with a well-deserved reputation as a blood-sucking shark, another was a state's attorney, and the third was a senior Texas Ranger officer. All of them were located in Dallas. I talked to my dad and told him I fired Alan as our lawyer. He was fine with it. Why the hell did you do that? He asked. I explained what Alan had told me and then showed him the DNA and video evidence I had presented to Alan. His tone changed significantly. Oh, shit, he said. I suspected Steve was a snake, but I didn't think so much. You've got to get the kids out of the house. There's no telling what they'll do. I agreed, but wondered what excuse I could use. My father already had a plan. When do you have appointments in Dallas? He asked. I told him I had an appointment for tomorrow. Okay. Tell Jolene that I'm sending you to Phoenix to survey the area, and you may be gone for a few days. I'm going home with you just in case. Have the kids pack up and stay with us. Hopefully that will get them off the road for a while, he said. Are you planning on telling the kids about this? I have to, Dad. They deserve to know the truth, I said. I won't scold their mom, but they're old enough to make their own decisions. Okay, son, you do what you think is right and your mom and I will support you, he said. I called Brian's cell phone and explained that he and Jessica would be staying with his grandparents starting today. What's going on, Dad? he asked. I'll tell you later. Just make sure both you and your sister are home right after school, I said. Grandpa will pick you up from there. Okay, Dad, we'll be there, he said. Love you guys, I said. I could almost hear his face turn red with embarrassment. I love you too, Daddy, he whispered. A few minutes later, I got a message from my secretary. Bill, Steve Jenkins is here to see you, she said. I pulled my gun out of its holster and placed it on the desk for easy retrieval, turned on the VCR to capture the meeting, and told the secretary to send it over and let my father know he was here. Steve walked into the office like he owned the place and immediately saw the 9mm pistol on my desk. Not a bad piece of equipment you've got, he said. Didn't know computer geeks used guns. 
What do you want, Steve? I asked. Straight to the point. Okay. Look, I know you went to see Alan Jackson today, he said. So? What's in it for you? I asked. If you're thinking of divorcing Jolene, forget it, he said. I don't care if you know about her and me, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let you drag me through the mud in court. Tell me, Steve, why? I thought we were friends. Why did you and Jolene do that? How long did it last? How long? He asked. That's a good one. You're going to like this. We actually started back during prom. You remember, don't you? Ashley was my date, but Jolene and I got away for a while and got into it. You were dancing with Ashley when we got back, remember? Hell, we were all 18 at the time, so we weren't doing anything illegal. Then we got back together when you were at Quantico. Remember when I messed up my knee at Pendleton? We did that quite a bit until you came back. Jolene was on birth control, but I guess she forgot to take it the day you got married, he said. You were my best man, asshole, I said. I was hers too. I have to admit, I really enjoyed watching her walk down the aisle. She was so beautiful. And guess what? Nine months later, Brian was born, he said. Well, isn't that a kick in the butt? Of course, we weren't together until you brought her home on vacation. That was just before you went to Okinawa. Yeah, Jolene and I had a good time. Spent almost every night together while you were there. She got pregnant about six months later and had an abortion. Didn't want you coming home with a pregnant wife. Hell, I even slept with her the day your plane landed. And guess what? Nine months later, Jessica showed up, he said. By the way, it was my idea to have Jolene make you get a vasectomy. We didn't want her to have any of your children. Thought it would be too complicated to keep track of who was born to whom. Jolene screwed up a couple times over the years and she had to go to a border. Good thing your insurance covers abortions. We were doing great all these years until you decided to wise up. You couldn't just leave things the way they were. Nah, you had to become outraged and righteous. That's how it's going to be. Now that you know about us, there's no need to divorce and hide it. From now on, I'll come to you any time of the day or night. And when I'm there, I'll play with Jolene. Wherever I want. And when I am there, you will remember that I am the master of the house. You will do what I say when I say and how I say. And if you get any ideas in your head about stopping me, think of the kids. I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. You bastard, I said. You touch one hair on those kids and I'll put you down like a rabid dog. And I don't care if it's the last thing I do in my life. Talk all you want, asshole, Steve said. Just remember who's in charge around here. Hell, I own this county. I own the sheriff's department. I own every goddamn judge in the courthouse. And now I own you. You play ball, you'll be all right. You step out of line and everything will be all right. For you and for the kids. Would you hurt your own children? I asked. What happened to you? I've grown up, Steve said. And you better grow up too, Cookie. I'll see you around. Steve walked out of the office and I stopped the tape. I burned it to DVD, sent a copy of the video to my dad and my contacts in Dallas, and called my dad. Dad, check your mail. We better move right now, I said. He just threatened me and the kids. Okay, my father said. Let me make the call. Call Brian and have him pick up Jess and come to my house. Let the school know and I'll meet you at the house. I think it's time to evict your wife. I agreed and called the school, informing them that under no circumstances should my wife or Steve Jenkins pick up the children or even be in the building explaining that it could be a matter of life and death. I also informed them that the children must leave immediately. I called Brian and told him to pick up Jess immediately and drive directly to his grandfather's house, no questions asked. I'll talk about you kids later today, I promise, I told him. And under no circumstances have any contact with your mother or Steve. This is very important. Do you understand? Yeah, Dad, I got it. What's going on? He asked. There's no time to explain now, son. Just do as I say, okay? Okay, Dad, he said. I grabbed my gun, the DVD I had just burned, walked out of the office and jumped in my truck. I knew my dad would be on his way soon, so I didn't wait. If he said he was going to be somewhere, then he would be. I pulled out and headed home.
About 15 minutes later, I pulled up in front of my house. I didn't see Steve's truck, but Jolene's car was there. Oh, good. I knew my dad would be here soon. I walked into the house looking around for Steve or anyone else who might be waiting to hurt me. I kept my right hand on my holstered pistol. I didn't see or hear anyone at first. I took an uncertain step into the house. Jolene was coming down the stairs. Bill, you're home early, she said. Did something happen? I looked at her, at first saying nothing. Is Steve or anyone else here? I asked. Why would Steve be here? She replied. I think you know why Steve is here. Maybe to get himself an afternoon hookup or to set up my murder, I said. Jolene's eyes widened, and she brought her hand up to her mouth. Yes, Jolene, I know. Oh my God, she said. I'm so sorry. Bullshit. Let me show you what your lover just told me, and then I'll give you 30 seconds to grab your shit and get out of my house, I said. I put the DVD in the player, turned on the TV, and pressed play on the remote. I watched Jolene's reaction to Steve's confession and his threat. Bill, it's not what you think, she said. Please let me explain. Steve just said some nasty things. We can work things out. Are you kidding me? You conspired with Steve to cuckold me from the beginning, then you conspired with him to deny me children, and then you conspired with Steve to kill me. What the hell kind of people are you? Now take your shit and get the hell out of here. Now goddammit! I never raised my voice at her, but she was clearly frightened. I reached out, took her left hand, and pulled the rings off of it. I put my grandmother's ring in my pocket, took off mine, and slipped it into her hand. Eat it, bitch, I growled. Bill, please don't do this to me. I'm so sorry, she wheezed through her tears. Yeah, you're sorry, all right. You're a sorry excuse for a wife. Now get out of here. I grabbed her purse and threw it at her. It hit her in the chest. She rushed to the door. I rushed her. Move, damn it, I said. I was tempted to kick her ass, but I'd been raised never to hit a woman. We walked outside and went to her car. She turned to me as she opened the door. Where will I go? She asked, crying. First of all, I said, stop your damn tears. You got what you wanted. Second of all, I don't care. Go to Steve, go to your mother's apartment, or better yet, go to hell. Having said that, I noticed two cars pull up to the driveway. Dad's truck pulled up first, followed by Steve's. Jolene instantly stopped crying and smirked at me. Now we'll see who has to go, baby, she said wryly. It would be so much easier if you just cooperate with us. Are you really going to do that? I asked. In a heartbeat, she said. Dad swung his truck around to block Steve's access to the house and stopped. Steve slammed on the brakes, missing his father's truck by only a couple of feet. Steve jumped out of the car. My dad did too. He pulled out his 12-gauge shotgun, loaded around, and pointed it at Steve. What the hell are you doing, Jennings? Steve yelled. I'm following a restraining order, my father said. What kind of restraining order? asked Steve. The one against you and your lover. The one that says you two must stay 500 feet away from my family and our property, Dad said. And believe me, asshole, I'd like nothing more than to hurt you. So get in your truck and get out of here. Steve wasn't used to being talked to like that, so he stopped moving forward. Two cars with flashing lights pulled into the driveway and stopped behind Steve's truck. Four state highway patrol officers got out of them with their pistols at the ready. We'll take it from here, Mr. Jennings, one of the officers said as he approached Steve. Dad lowered his gun as the officer handed Steve a restraining order. Is that her? He asked, nodding his head toward Jolene. Dad shook his head. The officer walked over to Jolene and me and handed her the paper. Mrs. Jennings, you have been served with an order requiring you to stay 500 feet away from any member of the Jennings family and any property under the control of the Jennings Historic Family Foundation, which includes this house, he said. If you refuse to obey this order, you will be taken into custody. Do you understand? Yes, I know, Jolene said quietly. Excuse me, officer, I said, as he started to turn away. He stopped and looked at me. Yes, Mr. Jennings? He asked. I pulled a digital audio recorder out of my shirt pocket. 
I'd appreciate it if you'd take Jolene and Mr. Jenkins into custody, I said. And why would I do that? he asked. I hit the play button so they could hear the threat Jolene had just made to me and the kids. Jolene looked like she was about to cry. The officer gave her a hard look before pulling out the handcuffs. Mrs. Jennings, you are under arrest. Please turn around and put your hands behind your back, he said. After handcuffing Jolene and reading her her Miranda rights, he radioed another officer and ordered him to arrest Steve. You're going to pay for this, asshole, Jolene said as she was led away in handcuffs. You're all going to pay. By this time, another car had pulled into the driveway. A van from the local TV station stopped, and a reporter followed by a camera crew walked up the driveway while Steve was being arrested. They managed to get a report on his arrest that made the evening news. Steve was, to put it mildly, displeased. God damn it, do you know who I am? He asked the officer, handcuffing him. Yeah, I know, the officer said. And frankly, I don't care. You're under arrest anyway. I'll get your badge for that, shouted the red-faced Steve. I realized I should have mentioned their plot to kill me, but I didn't have that evidence with me. Some of it was still in the DVD player in the house, and events were moving pretty fast. Nevertheless, I knew that my contacts in Dallas had the evidence and were working on the charges. The news van backed up and shifted so the patrol cars could pull out of the driveway. The reporter and her cameraman came toward me, followed by my father. Mr. Jennings, could you explain why Commissioner Jenkins was just arrested? She asked. Yes, I can, I said. As far as I know, making death threats is still a crime, and even popular politicians like Steve and his married girlfriend are covered by the law. Now, if you don't mind, I've got kids to take care of. I stepped back and my father joined me, leaving the reporter and her cameraman in shock. The voters in our district had treated Steve well and I knew that his reputation as a man who espoused family values had just taken a major hit. Unfortunately, the voters didn't know Steve the way I knew him. But I'll make sure they find out. My next stop was my parents' house, where I explained everything to those who were left of my family. I hated telling my children that the man they knew as Uncle Steve was actually their biological father. But I felt I had to tell them the truth. At first, they didn't want to believe it, but I had the DNA test results to prove it. I don't care what that piece of paper says, Jessica said. You're my father and you always will be. I agree, Brian said. I love those kids and was proud of them, even if the donor was Steve. We hugged and shed a few tears. After saying a tearful bye to my kids and family, I went back to my house, packed up my stuff to last me a couple days, and headed to Dallas. And that's when you found out how bad it really was? Asked Ashley, interrupting my narrative. Yeah, I said, resuming my narration after another sip of coffee. The next day I met with Dave Brooks, a Dallas attorney known as a bloodthirsty shark who usually gets his way in the courtroom. What I didn't realize was that he had arranged for me to meet with all three men I had approached. I was quite surprised to see them all in place when I showed up at his office early that afternoon. Sorry to come down on you like this, Mr. Jennings, Dave said, but after that last video you sent us, we thought it would be best if we all got together. I accepted his apology, and he introduced me to the other two men. John Hancock, a prosecutor from the state's attorney's office, shook my hand and took charge of the meeting. A mister. Jennings, let me start by apologizing for what you've been through, he said. There's no easy way to say this, so I'll just speak up. We have evidence, lots of evidence, showing that Steve Jenkins is not only involved in a number of criminal acts, but that he was assisted by your wife. Not only is he involved in drugs, but we have evidence that he ran guns, engaged in human trafficking and human slavery, and was involved in organizing prostitution. Worse, forensics directly links him to at least six murders. Furthermore, your wife is involved in much of this activity, especially the prostitution. We had hoped to have a little more time to put this together, but the threats against you and your children have forced us to push the timeline back considerably, he said. The third man, Don Jacobs, captain of the Texas Rangers, summarized the situation from his point of view. He made it clear to me that the entire sheriff's department had been compromised and could not be trusted to do its job. As a result, he said, efforts were made to temporarily replace the department with Rangers and DSS officers until a replacement could be trained and hired. 
Unfortunately, that includes the correctional facilities where Jenkins and your wife are being held, he said. So we need to act quickly before the situation worsens. As for your divorce, Dave said, I'll be pushing for an annulment, given your wife's criminal activity and the deception she and Jenkins used against you. If that doesn't work, we'll file on the grounds of adultery and mental cruelty. From what you have provided, I believe you will get all of your assets, as well as custody of your children, if that is what you want. We talked for another hour or so, discussing strategy and possible scenarios. Dave handed me a DVD that he said contained videotapes of my wife's actions by private and government investigators. Some of them, he said, were quite graphic in nature and involved several men, including sheriff's deputies. John concluded by telling me what he was going to do with Steve and Jolene. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Mr. Jennings, he said. I'm going to impose the death penalty, at least as far as Jenkins is concerned. Your wife might get lucky and get life in prison without parole. However, I must warn you, he added. Your life and the lives of your family members are in danger. Be very careful. From what I've seen, you and your children are damn lucky to be alive right now. People who cross paths with those two usually die. You have our direct numbers. So if you see anything or suspect anything, call us immediately. Do you hear me? I hear you, I said. We shook hands and parted ways. My mind was in a daze. The man I once thought was my best friend turned out to be not only a murderer, but also drugs, guns, prostitution, and little else. And my so-called loving wife was a part of it all. The ride home was spent thinking about everything that had happened in the last 17 years. How could I have missed it? Had I been so blinded by love and friendship? I finally got back to town and got a frantic call from my son. Dad, you have to come home right now, Brian said. What's going on? I asked. Just come home now, he said and hung up. I pressed on the gas and made it home in about 20 minutes. When I saw the ambulance and traffic police patrol cars in front of the house, I immediately thought about what I had been told. I rushed to the door just as the paramedics were wheeling the gurney outside. I stopped them to see what was wrong. The paramedic pulled back the corner of the sheet, revealing Jolene's face. I'm sorry, Mr. Jennings, the paramedic said. She's gone. Oddly enough, I wasn't that upset. Stepping inside, I found Steve being transported on another gurney. His left shoulder had been shattered by a shotgun blast, but judging by his groans, he was still alive. I saw the kids and the father standing off to the side. Thank God they seemed to be okay, I thought. Avoiding the blood on the carpet, I walked over to them and hugged them, making sure they were okay. What happened? I asked. Dad replied. I brought my kids here to buy a few things, he said. We had been here for a few minutes when these two came inside. I guess they managed to bail them out. Jessica and Jolene got into a fight, and Steve pulled out a gun. I heard a noise and went in the back door. Brian and I were in the backyard packing up. I grabbed my shotgun and walked in just as Steve pulled out his gun. Jolene tried to get him to put the gun down, but it went off. He shot her accidentally, I think. Right in the gut. I pulled Steve's shoulder out and called 911. That's when Brian called you. Jolene didn't last long. She was gone by the time the ambulance arrived. I'm sorry, son, he said. I shook my head. It's okay, Dad, I said. You did the right thing. And then I remembered that the security system on the home server was still running. I checked and made sure that the whole incident was captured on video. I showed the video to one of the officers while the other took statements from my father and children. He asked me to make a copy, which I did. I interrupted my narrative to take another sip of coffee. Do you have that video? Ashley asked. Actually, yes, I said pulling a disc out of the stack. I put it into the DVD player and pressed a button on the remote. The video began with Jolene and Steve entering the house through the front door. Shortly afterward, Jessica entered the room. What are you two doing here? She asked. You shouldn't be here. You should be in jail. We bailed you out, Jolene said. And we've picked you kids up. You're coming with us. I'm not going anywhere with either of you. Jessica said. You have to leave now. Jolene grabbed Jessica's wrist. Oh, yes, that's right, young lady. 
You and your brother are leaving with us now, Jolene said. Jessica squirmed and pulled away from her mother. No way, bitch, Jessica yelled. I hate you and I'm not going anywhere with you. Jolene slapped her hard across the face. Oh yes, it is, she replied. I have prepared a fine room for you in Abilene. You will go and do whatever I say. Jessica struck back, hitting her mother in the face. That's not going to happen, she said. Jessica, stunned by the blow, grabbed Jessica's hands in both of hers. Oh, yes, you are, she said. You're going to be our new star. Aren't you, Steve? Steve grinned back. The boys are going to like you, girl, he said. Steve and Jolene laughed as Jessica was hit with the realization of what they were up to. She began to struggle even harder and finally broke free of her mother's grip. I'm not going and you can't make me, she said. Now get the hell away from me. Steve pulled a gun from behind his belt and started waving it around as he spoke. Well then, I guess it's over for you and your brother, he said. Jolene turned to Steve and tried to reason with him, and Jessica started screaming, calling for her grandfather. Wait, Steve, we agreed we weren't going to finish them off here. Let's take them to a place off the Indian Trail where they won't be found. You know the place, she said. Steve shook his head angrily. No, he said. No, Steve, put the gun down before there's an accident. We'll deal with them, but not here. We have to stick to our plan, she said. They started struggling and then a loud gunshot rang out, followed by an even louder one. At this point, I stopped watching the DVD. That's when Brian called me, he said. You already know the rest. Ashley wiped tears from her eyes as I stood up from the couch. I'm done for the day, if you don't mind, I said. I think I'll go out in the backyard and have a smoke and then go to the cafeteria. Ashley stood up and followed me out. I'll join you if that's okay, she said. We each had a cup of fresh coffee and walked out onto the back porch. For a while, neither of us said anything. The silence was broken by Ashley. I forgot how dark and quiet it is out here, she said. I guess I'm used to city life. She looked at me for a moment before saying something else. Bill, you need to get it over with before it tears you apart, she said. Easier said than done, I told her. How do you come to terms with the fact that the woman you've loved all these years has been lying to you all this time? I feel like I've been cheated out of my whole life. My kids aren't even mine for crying out loud. I understand a little of how you feel, she said. Remember, my husband was a serial cheater. But not everyone is like that. Yeah, I know, I said quietly. Ashley put her arms around me, trying to comfort me. Whatever it takes, Bill, just know that I'm here for you, okay? I'll always be here for you. I hugged her back and thanked her. It was nice to have her around, and she felt really good around me. I can't tell you how many times I wish we had met in high school, she said. I thought the same thing. Maybe if my dad hadn't transferred to Austin, we would have. And none of this would have happened. You know, I was even jealous of Jolene in those days. Really? I asked. But you were with Steve. The only reason we dated was because you and Jolene were hot at the time. But I had my doubts even then. I knew Steve wasn't the type to get attached to one girl. He even told me that, she said. Well, there's no point in crying about it now, I said. Besides, if you and I had gotten together, you wouldn't be a reporter in the big city. Proofed, she said. Yeah, sure. You know there are times when I'm willing to give it all up just to be with a good man, she added, looking at me. I looked at her again. You know, I think you would, I said. After a while, we went back to the house and got ready to end the day. I decided to lie down on the couch, as I had done many times since Jolene had been shot. Even though there was a DSS officer posted outside, I was still concerned that one of Steve's buddies might sneak in. Besides, I still wasn't sure how things would work out with Ashley, and I didn't want to escalate things, considering I'd only slept with one woman in my entire adult life. Ashley thankfully understood. Just don't make a habit of it, cowboy, she said, smiling. I lay down and fell soundly asleep, waking up to the smell. Bacon! Rise and shine, Ashley said, standing over me in a long t-shirt. Breakfast is ready, so come and get it!
I got up from the couch and made my way to the kitchen table to admire the scene before me. Ashley had made pancakes, bacon, sausage, grits, toast, eggs, cookies, and gravy. My kind of breakfast. She even remembered to put peanut butter on the table. I was one of those guys who loves peanut butter on pancakes. A guy could get used to this, I said. Ashley walked over to the table with fresh coffee. How long have you been up? Not for long. I hope you like it, she said. It's been a long time since I've made breakfast for a man. It certainly smells good. You'll definitely get my mom's approval for that, I said. I'm impressed. Didn't you cook like this for your husband? I said foreman. My ex-husband considered fast food egg biscuits as breakfast. Bleh, she said. Dig in, cowboy. We got a lot to do today, she added, smiling. So what's on the agenda for today? I asked, savoring the feast on my plate. Well, she said, I'd like to see your family today, and then I thought we could visit Jolene's mother. I thought she might be able to give some insight into Jolene's thought processes. Then, if there's time left, I'd like to stop by the cemetery and take pictures of Jolene's final resting place. And by the way, if you're counting on the same breakfast tomorrow morning, we'll have to stop by the store. You're almost out of everything, she said. I devoured the food like I hadn't eaten in a week, stopping to sip coffee and express my verbal appreciation for Ashley's cooking. Jolene hadn't made breakfast like this in years, and I felt like I'd died and gone to heaven. I finished my meal, feeling more satisfied than I had in a long time. I stood up and hugged and kissed Ashley, thanking her for the wonderful breakfast. That was awesome, I told her. I guess I better go get ready. Please do it, she said. You're beautiful, but you need a shave. I went upstairs and thought about Ashley while I showered and shaved. In less than 24 hours, I found myself falling in love with her just like I had in high school. Could it be, I thought, that Ashley and I are destined to be together? For the first time in months, I felt content. Ashley had used the shower on the second floor and was dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. She looked the same as she had once looked a long time ago. Grabbing her laptop bag and purse, she beckoned me to go. We arrived at my parents' house and were greeted by two kids who ran out of the house as soon as I pulled up. I introduced everyone to Ashley and we walked into the living room. Ashley explained what she wanted to do and asked if she could talk to everyone one-on-one -on -one in private. We all agreed, so Mom excused herself and went into the kitchen to make dinner, and Dad took me into the living room. Ashley started with Jessica, and after spending an hour with her, talked to Brian at length. Dad and I waited and spent most of our time talking about manly things. Hunting, fishing, soccer, not much else. We both avoided anything to do with Jolene and or Steve. A couple hours later, Ashley came into the room and asked to speak to my dad. I took the hint, grabbed the kids, and went outside to throw the soccer ball around. It took a little over an hour, but she finished with both of my parents and went outside to join us until lunch was ready. The kids seemed to really bond with Ashley, and she seemed to enjoy spending time with us. We split into teams of two and played soccer. Jessica and I teamed up against Ashley and Brian and had a great time until Mom said lunch was ready. I enjoyed relaxing with Ashley and the kids, and for a while I felt like I had a happy family again. After lunch, we said our goodbyes and prepared to leave. Jessica caught up with me before I went out the door. Daddy, she whispered as she hugged me. If you don't ask her to marry you, I swear I'll kick your ass. What could I say? I promised her I'd think hard about it. So, how did your interviews go? I asked Ashley when we left. That went very well, thank you, she said. Bill, I know you're having trust issues right now, so I'd like to explain why I interviewed everyone privately. She was quite perceptive, perhaps a result of reporters' instincts. It's good journalistic practice to get independent confirmation, you know. It's not that I don't believe you, I do. And I do believe you. I watched those videos with you, remember? but I wanted them all to feel free to speak out without outside influence. I hope you can understand me, she said. I actually understood, and the fact that she explained everything without me saying anything meant a lot. I understand, Ashley. You're doing your job and being a professional. So have you learned anything new? Actually, yes, she said. Jessica told me that Steve has been making signs of attention to her, and for quite some time now. That son of a bitch, I said. I also learned that your family loved you very much and thought everything of you, she added. 
They also loved Jolene, but they were having problems with her and thought something was going on with her. They didn't say anything because they didn't want to interfere with your marriage. I think if they knew something specific, they would have definitely said something. What else did you find out? I asked. I learned what it was like to be part of a close-knit family. And I loved it, she said. I really enjoyed spending that time with you and the kids. Thank you for including me. I'd love to, I said. The kids and I had a great time, too. I think you made a big impression on them. We pulled up to the apartment complex where Jolene's mother, Myrna, lived, parked and headed for the door. Do you want to interview her privately as well? I asked. I don't think that will be necessary, she said. Besides, something tells me you and she should clear all this up. Myrna Carter opened the door at the first knock and invited us in. She moved slowly, partly for health reasons and partly because of depression. Her husband, Jolene's father, had died several years ago in a mysterious accident, and after Jolene's death, she had been left alone, with no direct relatives. How are you feeling? I asked, hugging her. I'm doing fine, Bill, thanks for asking, she said. She hugged Ashley and looked her over from head to toe. Ashley Marks, you're as beautiful now as you were in high school. Thank you for coming to see an older woman. Ashley smiled as Myrna motioned for us to sit down. What brings you here? she asked. I explained what Ashley was doing and Myrna nodded her head approvingly. So what can I tell you? she asked. Well, Mrs. Carter, I'm curious about something. This affair between Jolene and Steve continued throughout her marriage. You must have known about it. I'm curious to know why you didn't say anything to Bill? Myrna lowered her eyes before answering. She looked embarrassed. Yes, I knew, she said. I'm sorry, Bill. I should have said something to you. You didn't deserve what they did to you. How long have you known? I asked. Almost from the beginning, she said. Remember that year you spent in Okinawa? Steve practically lived with Jolene all that year. They were careful to make sure he wasn't in the house when your family was around. I told her she was making a huge mistake, but she refused to listen to me. So, I began. If Jolene wanted to be with Steve so badly, why did she marry me? I would have let her go if she'd just said she wanted to be with him. She was a confused girl, Bill. She actually loved you both, but in different ways. You see, to her, you were stable, dependable, a good husband and father. Steve, on the other hand, wanted nothing to do with raising children. He had always been a wild child and didn't want to commit to the bonds of marriage. You were a support for her and he was a source of adventure. I'm sorry, Myrna, I said. Jolene had sex with Steve the day we got married. She had two children with him and passed them off as mine. In the end, she plotted to kill us all. These are not the actions of a loving wife. I know it's hard to believe, Bill, Myrna said. But she really did love you, at least at first. At least that's what she told me. So, what happened? asked Ashley. What changed Jolene so much? Well, Ashley, people change over time, I guess, Myrna said. Steve latched onto Jolene and soon began to control her. I told her about it once, but she warned me that if I said anything to Bill, I'd regret it later. Myrna looked at me. That's why I stopped coming to the kids, Bill. I'm sorry, but I just couldn't go there and look you in the eye knowing what Jolene was doing. I knew I'd probably say something that would hurt them. Sometimes they scare the hell out of me. Did you know about her abortions? asked Ashley. Myrna nodded. Yes, it is. Jolene confided in me about it. I told her she was being stupid and would get caught sooner or later, but she just shrugged it off. Said it was her choice and Bill had no say in it. I suggested she do the right thing and divorce Bill. She laughed and said she would never divorce. Said it wouldn't be long before she inherited everything Bill had anyway. How long ago was that? asked Ashley. I don't know, maybe it's been a year and a half or so, Myrna said. We left it up in the air for a few seconds. So Jolene and Steve had been meaning to do this to me for a long time. I wanted to say something, Bill, but I was so scared. You know how scary Steve can be. I knew. Something bothered me about all of this, so I spoke up. Myrna, did your husband know about all this? I asked. I think so, she said. I know she and Steve were talking just before the accident. 
Myrna's husband was known as one of the best mechanics in the area, if not the best, and took very good care of all his cars. Investigators called the accident an accident, but were never able to explain how one brake line mysteriously failed and how the traction mysteriously weakened. I guess that's all in the past now, isn't it? asked Myrna. By the way, I don't blame you and the kids for not attending the memorial service. Especially after what she did to you guys. I was hoping a few of her old friends would come, but it was just me and the priest, she added, wiping a tear from her eye. I want to thank you, Bill, for paying for the cremation. I thought it was interesting that you had them put her in a wedding dress. I was hoping that maybe Jessica would want to do that. Ashley looked at me. You cremated her in her wedding dress? Did you? Why? I told you I burned her wedding dress. I just didn't tell you that she was wearing it at the time. I also made sure she wore the wedding ring I gave her. To tell you the truth, I thought it was appropriate. I decided she didn't need our marriage, so... The last straw of revenge. I get it. Did you cremate her wedding ring too? Asked Ashley. But not the engagement ring. I nodded. She seemed half amused, taking notes. Anyway, Myrna said, I want to thank you for making sure I got a Jolene IRA. It helped a lot since I have a steady income and all. Jolene had an IRA? Asked Ashley. Yeah, I said. When she was shot, it had about $350,000 in it. I didn't even know she had it at the time. She also had another $200,000 in a savings account that I knew nothing about. I put it in a trust fund for the kids' college education. Don't ask me how she did it because I don't think I want to know. Interesting, she said, returning to her notebook. She turned to Myrna. Mrs. Carter, is there anything else you can add? Myrna shook her head. Nothing that catches my eye. I think you all know almost everything else. Myrna looked at me. I'm so sorry about the way things turned out, Bill. I put my arm around her. It's okay, Myrna. Listen, feel free to stop by the kids anytime you want, okay? I'm sure they'll be happy to see you. She nodded and thanked me, then hugged Ashley. Thanks for stopping by, she said as we got ready to leave. And please don't be strangers, okay? We promised to stay in touch and left. You cremated her in her wedding dress and wedding ring? Asked Ashley as we got into the pickup. It felt like it at the time, I said. Ashley went back to her notes as I made my way to the cemetery. We made our way through the manicured grounds until we reached the columbarium where her ashes were kept. The short granite plaque read Jolene Carter and listed the year of her birth and the year of her death. There was no further indication on the plaque of who or what she was. At least you treated her remains with some dignity, Ashley said. Well, I said, it was done mostly for Myrna's sake. If it were up to me, I'd just flush her ashes down the toilet. Interesting that you made them use her maiden name, she added. Yeah, I figured since she didn't have any use for our family in her life, I wouldn't burden her with the family name for eternity, I said. They tried to get me to write something like loving wife and mother on the monument. I figured they wouldn't write cheating whore or lying conniving bitch, so I kept it simple. Ashley took her pictures and turned to me and put her hand on my chest. There's still a lot of anger in him, isn't there? Tell me, Bill, did you ever mourn for her? At all? She asked. The truth was, no. In fact, I hadn't shed a single tear since she was shot. All my love for her had been burned away by her lies and cheating. Her threats against the children and myself had pretty much destroyed all my feelings for her. Part of me was ashamed, and it brought tears to my eyes. Damn it, I didn't want to do this in front of Ashley. I shook my head and started to turn away so Ashley wouldn't see my tears. She stopped me and made me turn around to face her. You need to get it out of your head, Bill, before it eats you up, she said. Let it go and you can move on with your life. What kind of life is this, Ashley? I asked. Everything I thought I had all these years turned out to be a lie. Everything. I shook my head and tears began to roll down my cheeks. Ashley wrapped her arms around me and pulled me tight against her. That's what happened. I sobbed uncontrollably for quite a while. Ashley didn't say anything but kept hugging me tightly, kissing my face from time to time. I finally calmed down and looked at Ashley. I wiped a tear from her face that had rolled down her cheek. What's that? I asked. 
She was my friend too, remember? The four of us, you, me, Steve, Jolene, the four musketeers. I loved her like a sister back then, she said. I hate what she turned into, but I loved her anyway. You loved her too, and for a very long time. You married her, raised two children with her. That must mean something. You're probably right, I said. Damn right, cowboy. I'm here and now, Bill, she added. And I'll be here as long as you need me or want me, got it? I smiled. I get it, I told her. She smiled and patted my chest. We need to get to the store before it gets too late, she said. What do you want to do about dinner? I thought for a moment before answering. How about a trip to Charlie's, I asked. They're cooking a killer steak and there's a band there tonight. You're asking me out on a date? In front of your wife's ashes? Why not, I asked. She smiled, kissed me on the lips and looked at Jolene's marker. Bye, Jolene, she said. Your husband is asking me out. I stared at the marker for a while before returning to the truck. Bye, honey, I whispered. I thought I heard a quiet sob next to me, but there was no one there. I figured it was the wind playing tricks on my mind, but without wasting any time, I walked back to the truck where Ashley was waiting for me. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, I said, starting the pickup. Let's go get breakfast and get ready for tonight. We stopped by the farmer's market where we bought eggs, bread, milk, bacon, and anything else Ashley thought we might need and then headed home. Home? What a concept. For a while, I'd thought of this place as just a house, a place where I slept. But now being here with Ashley felt natural to me. I showered, shaved, and dressed, then waited for Ashley to finish doing what women did when they were getting ready for a date. Finally, she came down the stairs wearing a denim skirt that came down a couple inches above her knees and a white blouse. She completed the ensemble with a pair of rather expensive cowboy boots. A woman to my taste. She was beautiful. And today she was my date. I offered her my arm and we walked together to our chariot. Charlie's restaurant was well known in our area for serving the best steaks with all the condiments. Potatoes and string beans with soft cookies completed the meal. Afterward, we had a beer and looked over to the dance floor where several other couples had already started dancing. Do you want to dance? I asked. Of course, Ashley said. We danced. And danced. And danced some more. We did two step dances, a few quick waltzes, a few slow dances, and even took part in a line dance, something I hadn't done in a long time. Ashley was with me the whole time, but excused herself to the ladies' room a couple times. We were dancing to a slow tune with our arms around each other when Ashley stopped and slid into me with a soft, sensual kiss. Our tongues lingered for a bit, making me very excited down below. She leaned down to my ear. I love you, Bill Jennings, she whispered. Always have and always will. That's it. And to tell you the truth, I fell in love with it too. I love you too, Ashley Marks, I said. She licked her lips nervously for a moment. Take me home and make madly passionate love to me, cowboy, she said. Otherwise, I'll have no choice but to pounce on you right here. Who could refuse such an offer? Then we better get this situation under control, little lady, I said in my best horrible John Wayne impersonation. She smiled, took my hand, and led me into the parking lot. Take me home now, she purred. And yeah, she started entertaining me in the car. Thank God it was dark and my windows were tinted as much as the law allowed, I thought. Otherwise, we might have been stopped. Still, I enjoyed the show Ashley had put on for me. We're almost home, I told her. Good, she whispered. Finally, we got to the house. I parked in the garage and pushed the button closing the big door. I couldn't wait to get out of the car. Eventually, we calmed down and lay on the bed, her in my arms. I thought about the events of the past two days. Just 36 hours ago, I was a depressed, despondent man overcoming the pain of cheating on a lying spouse who had repeatedly disrespected me with a man I once considered my best friend. Now I had Ashley to show me what it was like to love again. I knew what I wanted to do, but I was afraid she'd think I was in too much of a hurry. Screw it, I thought. Full speed ahead? I looked up at her face, framed by long, dark hair. She was looking up at me. A penny for your thoughts, she said. 
I don't want it to ever end, I told her. Me neither, she said. And what do you propose to do about it? Interesting choice of words, I thought. Must be those damn reporter instincts again. I opened the nightstand drawer and pulled out a small box, the same box that held my great-grandmother's engagement ring. I'd taken it to the jeweler to have it thoroughly cleaned after I'd taken it from Jolene. Me neither, she said. And what do you propose to do about it? Interesting choice of words, I thought. Must be those damn reporter instincts again. I opened the nightstand drawer and pulled out a small box, the same box that held my great-grandmother's engagement ring. I'd taken it to the jeweler to have it thoroughly cleaned after I'd taken it from Jolene. Ashley was already sitting on the bed, her attention focused on the box. I told her about the ring and what it meant to me. The ring was originally given to my great-grandmother a couple years before my great-grandfather went to fight with the Germans in World War I. He fought in the Battle of Bellow Wood, the 1917 battle where the Marines were nicknamed Devil Dogs. He survived the war, but exposure to German gas shortened his life considerably. My great-grandmother passed the ring on to her oldest son, who gave it to his future bride. After Pearl Harbor, he fought the Japanese in the Pacific and was wounded at Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. My grandfather returned home and they had two boys, one of whom was my father. By the time my grandmother was about to pass away, my parents had been married a long time, so it was decided that I would get the ring. You see, Ashley, this ring not only symbolizes my love for you, but also over 100 years of Jennings family history. I understand if you'd prefer a new ring, but I want you to know what it means to me. This isn't just a hand-to-hands thing. Ashley looked at me, a tear in her eye. Yes, she said. Both and both. I will marry you and promise to make you the happiest man in the world for the rest of your life. And I will be proud to wear your great-grandmother's ring. There is only one condition. Condition? I asked. Yes, she said. Promise me you'll cancel the vasectomy. I plan to give you a whole house full of kids. Maybe someday I can pass it on to one of our grandchildren. I smiled, put the ring on her finger, and we kissed for a long time before making love once more and falling asleep in each other's arms. The next morning I woke up to the better-than-sex smell of bacon. I did my morning chores and went downstairs to see Ashley making another of her killer breakfasts. We ate breakfast and packed our bags for the trip to Dallas. We decided to shower together, which naturally led to another hot session of lovemaking. I decided to call the kids and give them the news after we finally got dressed and packed. I dialed the number and put it on speaker so Ashley and I could hear their answer. Woo-hoo! shouted Brian when I told them we were getting married. Jessica was just as happy. Good for you, Daddy, she said. You've got a real winner. Congratulations to you guys, my dad said. And welcome to the family, Ashley. Thank you, Mr. Jennings, she said. Mr. Jennings was my father, he said, laughing. You can call me Daddy if you want. Okay, Dad, Ashley said. Thanks again. Ashley, I'm so excited for you two, my mom said. Have you set a date yet? Not yet, Ashley said. I have some things to take care of in Austin first, but that will happen as soon as possible. I had one more thing to discuss with the kids. Brian, I said. You know, I think it would be great if you and Jessica visited your Grandma Carter from time to time. Just stop by to say hi and let her know you're thinking of her. She's still your grandmother, and she misses you. What do you say? Okay, Dad, he said. Good for you, I told him. Brian and Jessica were great guys, and I knew they'd do the right thing. We said our goodbyes and loaded into the pickup truck for the return trip. Something Ashley had said to my mom stuck in my mind. I almost forgot you were working in Austin. What are your plans? I mean, long-distance relationships don't always work out, I said. Do you know that Jake Carson is retiring as editor-in-chief of the Daily Record? She asked, referring to the local paper. I didn't know that, but I asked her to continue. I sent in my resume last week before we met, and they want to talk to me about the job. He won't retire until three months from now, and it will take me two months to finalize things at the Statesman. What if you don't get the job? I asked. That's okay, she said. I'll quit my job and live with someone I know in the neighborhood, she teased. Anyway, as I understand it, no one else is interested in the job, 
and the board really wants a woman at the helm, especially with my experience. And I have some ideas on how to improve circulation. Sounds like you've got it all figured out, I said. Well, I like to be prepared, she said. No matter what happens, you know I'll support you 100%, right? I asked. She wrapped her arms around my neck and looked into my eyes. And that's only part of the reason I love you so much, she said. Think about it. If I had stayed at Statesman, there's no telling where they would have sent me. Or for how long. They'd call me up in the middle of the night and send me across the country to cover some asshole politician. Then they'd send me across the country to cover something else. I was tired of living in hotels. So when I saw this opportunity, I had to jump at it. The paycheck probably won't go up much. In fact, the pay may end up going down, but it will be worth it just to live in one place. And if I don't get a job, that's okay too. I can always write online, maybe do some freelancing, or even write a book. Maybe start a blog about stupid people who cheat on their spouses. Personally, I'd rather spend all my time in bed with you. That's the plan I like best, I told her. Come on, let's go outside. After closing up the house, I plucked a few flowers from the front flower bed. If you don't mind, I'd like to make a stop along the way, I said. Oh, she asked. Do you have a girlfriend hiding in an alley somewhere? You should know better, I said. I knew she was just teasing, but the question still bugged me. I didn't make a big deal out of it. You're right, I'm sorry, she said. We both got burned, so it's a sore subject for me, too. I was actually thinking about everything you said yesterday at the cemetery. Thought it might be time to put it behind you, I said. Good for you, she replied. We pulled into the cemetery and stopped next to where Jolene's ashes were kept. We both got out of the car and walked toward the monument. I knelt down and placed the flowers in a vase next to the monument. By the way, Jolene, Ashley and I are getting married. Just thought you might be interested to know, I said. Yes, she's dead, I know, but saying it out loud seemed therapeutic for some reason. Ashley stood over me and spoke too. And if the kids are okay with it, I plan to adopt them, she said. We said our goodbyes and walked back to the truck. Do you really want to adopt children? I asked. Hell yeah, Ashley said. They deserve a mother they can trust. Are you okay with that? Of course, I said. In that moment, I realized that marrying Ashley was the best decision for all of us. I thought she would be an amazing mother, and I knew Jessica would need a strong, loving mother as a teenager. We were silent most of the way back to Dallas, and Ashley used the time to work on her story. She seemed to be enjoying the task, and I had time to reflect on the events of the past few months. Finally, we pulled up to the hotel and picked up our bags. You know, Ashley said, there's no reason for you to leave your room. The paper's paying for mine until this is over, so why don't you move in with me? I'll work on my articles, of course, but then we'll have plenty of time. I liked the idea and agreed with it. At least let me pay part of the bill, I said. She waved me away. You can pay for our dates, okay? She asked. And it was settled. I checked out of my room and moved in with Ashley. That night we went out for steak, danced a little, and went back to bed for another night of wild lovemaking. The next morning we got to the courthouse in time to get good seats. The jurors were brought in from the hotel and immediately began deliberations. Ashley did her duties as a reporter, taking testimony from attorneys representing both sides and talking to other observers and legal experts. It didn't take long for the jury to decide the case. By 1.30, word came that the jury was ready to deliver its verdict to the judge. Steve sat emotionless as the jury entered the room. The judge took his seat and asked if the jury had reached a verdict. We have it, Your Honor, the foreman said, handing the piece of paper to the bailiff. The judge read the paper and folded it back up. He turned to the foreman of the jury again. Is this a unanimous verdict? The judge asked. The foreman answered that it was. Very good, he said. Can the defendant stand? The judge asked. Steve and his attorney stood up. In People v. Steve Jenkins, the jury found the defendant Jenkins guilty on all charges and unanimously agreed to the maximum penalty provided by law, the death penalty, he said. Steve's attorney asked the jury to assess the penalty in the event of a guilty verdict, 
believing it would be easier to avoid the death penalty because the decision must be unanimous. If even one juror disagreed, the most Steve could get was life in prison without parole. It was a gamble, and Steve lost. Steve was found guilty of six counts of first-degree murder, one count of manslaughter, several counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and a host of other charges that included smuggling, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and prostitution. The defense asked to poll the jury and the judge agreed. One by one, each of the 12 jurors said they agreed with the verdict and the punishment. Mr. Jenkins, I'm not a big fan of the death penalty, but I completely agree with the jury's decision. If ever there was a case that deserved the death penalty, this is it. I order that you be taken from this court and transferred to Huntsville State Prison, where you will be put to death in the manner prescribed by law at the earliest opportunity. And may God have mercy on your soul, said the judge, striking the gavel. My lawyer approached me and gestured for me to follow him. We caught up with the officers escorting Steve out of the courtroom. He talked to them for a minute and they nodded, looking at me. Steve looked at me, his eyes red and his body hunched like an old man's. What are you looking at, asshole? He said. Right now I'm looking at a worthless piece of shit, I said. I always wanted to know what he looked like. Now I know. My lawyer handed Steve two forms and told him to sign them. What the hell? He asked. What the hell is this? One is a form to relinquish all parental rights to Brian and Jessica Jennings, and the other spells out the disposition of your estate upon execution. It's basically a will that says that what remains of your estate after taxes and penalties are paid will be liquidated and divided into three parts. One-third will go to Myrna Carter, the mother of your longtime lover, one-third to a trust for Brian Jennings, and one-third to a trust for Jessica Jennings, he said. Steve looked furious, but realized he was finally defeated and signed both forms. He looked at me with hatred in his eyes. Are you happy now? He asked. I will, I told him. By the way, Ashley Marks and I are getting married, and she's agreed to adopt the kids. Enjoy hell, asshole. I look forward to pissing on your grave. My attorney thanked the officers and we left. I didn't see Steve again until the day of his execution. And yes, I peed on his grave, but I made sure Ashley wasn't around. I didn't think she'd approve. Finally, the nightmare was over, and I was looking forward to a new chapter in my and Ashley's life. Epilogue True to her word, Ashley let me read the story she had written about me, and I was impressed. The story went viral, and Ashley took part in several talk shows to discuss the whole sordid episode. She was even approached about a possible movie deal, but she ultimately turned it down. She did, however, win a Pulitzer Prize for it. The statesman was reluctant to let her go, but realized her life had taken a different path and gave her a nice bonus and recommendation when she left. The Daily Record Board gladly accepted her as the new managing editor, and in the first year the small paper's circulation tripled, prompting the company to build a new facility and hire more staff. We both decided we wanted to avoid a big church wedding and got married in our backyard, inviting family and friends. Ashley's parents drove down from Austin along with a few of her closest friends from Statesman. Her dad walked her down the aisle and shook my hand warmly as he handed her to me. Brian was my best man and Jessica was Ashley's maid of honor, so it was truly a family wedding. After the vows were exchanged, the priest asked us all to turn to face the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Mr. and Mrs. William Jennings and his family to you for the first time, he said to loud applause. Brian walked over to Ashley and put his arm around her. Welcome to the family, Mom, he said, smiling. Ashley hugged him, tears in her eyes. Jessica hugged her too. I love you, Mom, she said. I love you too, Ashley said as she hugged both kids. My father came over and hugged us both, then reached into his pocket. I hope you enjoy your honeymoon, he said, pulling out an envelope that contained two tickets for a week-long Caribbean cruise. Thanks, Dad, Ashley and I said almost in unison. And a new adventure began. Ten months after returning from the cruise, Ashley gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. We named the boy William Frederick after my grandfather and the girl Alicia Marie after Ashley's grandmother. On their birthday, I happened to run into George Mason, a major politician in our neighborhood. He shook my hand, accepting my celebratory cigar. Congratulations, Bill, he said. 
I thanked him. By the way, he said, you know we have an election coming up. There are a few people who think you could take Steve's place on the old commission, if you're interested. After all, you're the one who brought him down in the end. Kind of like our own version of the man who shot Liberty Valens, right? I asked. He laughed. Except John Wayne wasn't waiting in the shadows this time, he said. Thanks, but I don't think I can take a pay cut. I have two new mouths to feed, I said. You could still run your business, he asked. Maybe there's another reason? Well, yes, there is. Dad said something the last time we discussed the whole Steve thing, I said. What's that? George asked. Power corrupts, I said. The end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.